some more of my philosophy. That's about the only title I can think of for this one because it doesn't belong to any category I would add to any of my YouTube playlists. And it's going to go all over the place a bit, but I'll tell you it begins with a little bit of quantum science and uh, philosophy, and it will move on into some Dhamma, what Buddhists would call Dhamma or enlightenment practices and theories. Uh, I don't usually like to make when people ask me to make podca uh, help them with a kata, an incantation, or a question about the Dharma, or the Dhamma, as I call it. In Thai we call it Dhamma. Tamma. Tamma. Patam. Actually we call it Patam. Uh, usually rather than answering each person one by one, which I used to do, find myself repeating myself and writing like four A4 size pages of explanations which could be useful to so many more people than one in a personal email or a message box and I don't like to do it so what I usually do is uh, when people ask me that I take it as a feedback idea to make a podcast about and then I publish it on YouTube or Facebook or sometimes SoundCloud which I'm now moving away from and I'm just going to use YouTube and Facebook. And then everybody can access it and benefit from it instead of just one person. But in this podcast, excuse me, in this podcast I want to do something I've never done before, which is uh, just run over some ideas that I've been talking about in messages, because I did get carried away today in messages with some people who were worth talking to and answering and fun to talk to and also had inspiring ideas to give back and I wanted to also share them with the world instead of just single people so I'm recording it so the first conversation I'm going to talk about is when I was chatting with a, a pra friend and a fellow practitioner uh, I was asking, we were talking about uh, how nature takes the path of least resistance. And um, I was talking to him about my idea that uh, I was mentioning a guy who made some programs called The Story of Maths, one called Algorithms and another one that's a three part or four part series called The Code which looks for uh, a simple kind of theory of everything I suppose and my, one of my personal missions is I'm try I believe that the artificial intelligence algorithms that teach themselves use the same mathematical uh, steps series of steps as nature does in the process of evolution and that it's the same mathematical process so I shared a video with him that uh, he already understands that anyway but I shared a video with him that explains emergence theory which is taking over now from string theory in quantum physics or quantum mechanics if you like and uh, just talking about the way things work and comparing it with how uh, one practices within spiritually and how nature works and how um, from a scientific side ha how actually science confirms the Buddha Dhamma and my friend said that uh, um, to something that I was saying that uh, um, how we evolve is something to do with ADHD because me and my friend we suffer ADHD attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and he has attention deficit disorder uh, so we were talking about the evolution of mankind and that ADHD 
Um, his doctor once said maybe in a hundred years uh, ADHD will become what we call normal and that just people are changing faster than social habits and society itself is changing and our minds are changing and so there are more and more people finding out they have ADHD and um, I was explaining about the lemming factor uh, from a documentary I saw which had a very good explanation about how evolution always has a few mutations of each species some of which die because they do unorthodox things and some of which uh, discover um, new ways of surviving or improvements because they do unorthodox things so uh, to me ADHD is not a con is not an illness it's a condition that is does not comply with the way society <laughs> they want you to do things in a certain order according to a certain process and a person with ADHD is not genetically his genetic makeup is not really uh, designed for that it's a different kind of existence and so um, the, the species learns from uh, right now we have people appearing who have ADHD it's actually a function of evolution that uh, it's a new, ki a new kind of thinking but it's seen as an illness and it's treated with medicine which works by the way I suffer it and it works um, but this documentary had a really good explanation about how evolution always has a few mutations of each species which helps the species evolve because the whole species and its mass mind and its genetic data pool then learns from the mistake of the unorthodox behavior of the mutant which is what's happening in uh, artificial intelligence that it's learning from itself and from its own mistakes or from the things it tries out, the possibilities it discovers or, or um, investigates or inspects, just like us. Um, and so in that case, ADHD sufferers in this day could be said to be the like these frontier pioneer scouts. Mm. Some of them die because of their unorthodox behavior. Some of them discover amazing things because of their unorthodox behavior. Mm. And then I was saying you have to study why lemmings throw themselves off the cliff every so many years. Or why a certain type of cicada only appears every 13 years. Because that's the number of regularity which causes it to coincide the least with other types of its own species which would either mix with it and destroy its gene pool or kill it and cause it to become extinct. And then I was asking why bees, um, the honeycomb, have six sides to each cell. I think it's six sides, or is it eight? Six. And why not three? Well, because mathematically it's the most efficient way to build using the least amount of wax which is very difficult for bees to make anyway and costs a lot of energy so it's the most energy efficient so nature always mathematically um, chooses the most efficient version or method which some would call the path of least resistance I wouldn't call it that yet but that's one way of saying it by seeking the most efficient manner artificial intelligence does the same evolution does the same and so um, these documentaries about the story of maths and algorithms and the four part series called The Code to me they are giving me hints because I'm trying to find a mathematical ratio which proves that the way artificial intelligence deep learning teaches itself uh, is exactly the same mathematical algorithm as nature uses in the process of the evolution of species. And that uh, this is the only way that anything can evolve, be it an artificial intelligence or a human, or any species, or any way that life or uh, material universe evolves step by step. And it uses this, if you put it mathematically, you would find they both use the same algorithm what we call artificial intelligence. It's called
cold. And so my friend commented, uh, yes, uh, like the flow of water, always following the path of least resistance, naturally reaching the lowest point in the river. When there's a stone in the river, it doesn't try to push the stone out of the way. It just flows past it. Mm -hmm. And I then got this wrong because I focused on the stone instead of the river. And uh, I answered something that's true first, but then I got lost on focusing on the stone. My first answer to that was, yes, in our perception, uh, it just flows past it. But actually it's resisting, and that's when I start referring to the stone, not the stream. By not flowing down the stream, with the water, the stone is resisting the stream, which is a false view. Because you could also say that uh, the stone is allowing the stream to flow around it. Yeah. So it's also doing nothing by that and not resisting. So you can find a way of saying it's resisting by saying it's not flowing downstream with the water. Or you could say it's not resisting because it's allowing the water to flow around it. Both of them are views. The Buddha didn't have a view because he said all views are um, personal and wrong because they're one-sided and they don't look at it from every side. If you look at a cube, you can't see all sides of it. You'd have to have three bodies so you could stand at the right angles to be able to see each side at the same time in order to understand a cube how it really is, right? And so then um, I went on to refer to, you can find this on YouTube, if you write the Arrow of Time, Brian Cox, there is an excerpt from one of his uh, fantastic documentaries, Professor Brian Cox has done a great things for science and to make science interesting for young people in the present day, uh, and he uses a sandcastle to show uh, begin his explanation of the arrow of time, where time flows forward and never backwards, and he and to explain the law of quantum law of entropy, which says that everything is falling apart always. Now Buddhism says all things are impermanent. That's one of the three marks of an existence. It's called anicca, anichang, anicca means all things are in constant change, they are impermanent. And uh, he takes a sandcastle and he shows how it dissolves and slowly just falls to pieces. And he says that this shows how you don't see an iceberg put itself together, you see it fall apart. Or you don't see the sandcastle build itself up in the sand, uh, you see it slowly erode and fall to pieces and be, and everything is moving from order to disorder and here's where we're going into dharma now a little bit as well as physics quantum physics because i said that uh brian cox's theory that the quantum law of entropy that all things are constantly falling apart and moving from orderly to chaotic I think I've proved him wrong, and I can explain it. Which my friend told me, I'd already told him about this before various times. I'm repeating myself. <coughs> I'm guilty of that. Because I said that uh, the reason it's not true, that when this sandcastle dissolves into the desert sand, that what was once orderly has become disorderly and that things are falling apart from order to disorder into chaos, into entropy, that all things are entropic in nature. Buddhism says all things are impermanent. So this sounds very similar to the Buddhist uh, principle that all things are impermanent. But here is where I think this is wrong. Because, firstly, all things are impermanent is a very basic understanding of anicca in Buddhism because anicca, what it really means is all things are constantly changing their state. Yeah, And all states, phenomena, are in a constant process of arising and ceasing. 
but they all cease. Yeah, but uh, so it's persistent. There is a persistent arising and ceasing. Yeah, but something is persisting, right? And so I explained that our perception of the sun castle and our idea that it is orderly yeah, is an illusion. It's false. Because in truth, I was speaking to my brother about this. He used to drive through the desert for days on end to cross the desert when he worked in Libya and he used to have to drive to Syria and stuff and use oil barrels to find the way. You could just see the next oil barrel and just follow the oil barrels. And he's seen the sand dunes change. And I asked him, I said, do you see the ripples in the dunes and the, chain, the, the shape of the dunes are changing constantly, no? And he said, yes, that's right. I said, but are the patterns that nature is making with the weather and the changing of the dunes and the ripples of the dunes, are they all harmonious and orderly? And he said, yes, they are. And so actually what we see as order, as the sandcastle dissolving into chaos, is not. Yeah, Because the natural state of the desert is beautiful rippled dunes that are constantly changing shape and they're beautiful. We all know that. We've seen beautiful... Uh, um, you can have it as your desktop screen, the desert. Uh, it's a nice, uh, what would you call that, a wallpaper. Mm. Absolutely beautiful yeah, and orderly in a natural manner. It's chaotic in the sense that it never repeats itself, but that's art for you, you know. It never repeats itself. It looks repetitive, you know, that's like the Mendelbrot set, but it actually never repeats itself. It just seems to follow the same pattern, but it's always ever changing and it's highly varied. Yeah. And that's its natural, beautiful order. And this sandcastle is where a human has come and taken the natural, orderly, rippled pattern of the sand dunes and made something totally chaotic out of it. This is also a wrong view, but it's just to destroy that view with. Don't get stuck to this view either. It's just another view to destroy the other view. Yeah. So the perception of the sandcastle as orderly is our idea. But uh, really, in truth, the true order is the ripples of the dunes. And that what seems to us to be an orderly sandcastle dissolving into chaos is actually nature taking something chaotic and synthetic that is impossible to remain and putting it back in place in its proper natural order and position along with the rest of the desert. Right? And so this theory of quantum entropy that everything is falling apart all the time is wrong. Well, they're not seeing they're seeing it, but they're interpreting it wrong. What they're seeing is not that everything falling apart. They're seeing everything getting rearranged constantly. Because everything is being constantly rearranged. Forever. Hmm? And so there's no chaos or order in that. Yeah, there's just a pattern, an algorithm. And nature has its algorithm. And you can make as many sandcastles as you want. In the end, it will go back to its original state. Which is why once, one of the few times the Buddha is said to have smiled, Ananda asked him, why do you smile? They were on Tudong through the forests. And he said, uh, because of the irony of, well, I don't know what he said, but roughly uh, the answer was, the response was, because... To me, I find it ironic, and I smile at it because of that, so I assume this to be his reason. That he pointed at a piece of very thick, overgrown jungle, and he said, you see over there? And Ananda said, yes. And he said, that was once a great kingdom and city, and uh, a great empire. 
a long, long time ago, and they walked onwards. And so it was, for me, the irony of impermanence to see how something so great is now just thick jungle, is to see how something so great, even greater than oneself, becomes that, is to see the impermanence and see how it's been rearranged. But I wouldn't say it's chaos. I'd say the jungle looks pretty orderly. It's not chaotic at all. It's beautiful, and so are sand dunes, and, and so is the ocean, and ice crystals, and so on. And the dunes and the patterns and the ripples are constantly changing, but they're orderly, they're perfect, they're harmonious. It's not entropy, it's natural order. So everything's constantly being rearranged. Rearranged. It's we humans. We imagine order as being the chaotic things we make, which are out of shape with nature. That's what we call order. Or the fallible systems we create, such as a monetary system, we call that order. It's not. It's Koyanis Katsi. That's what the Hopi Indians called life out of rhythm or life out of balance, life out of the natural algorithm of nature, yeah, moving to the false algorithm. Yeah, things fall apart, but they get put back together again in a different shape and style. You know, and personally, I said, I think the sand dunes, they look much more orderly than some stupid sand castle. And there is no arrow of time. There is just a theory of an arrow of time. Order and chaos are mere perceptions. They are imagined. There is no order or chaos. There's just a natural rhythm, algorithm of nature. If the law of entropy was true, how could DNA have built itself, rearranged itself into that from what, whatever it was before? Huh? That's not falling apart. What kind of entropy is he talking about? We have a rising and ceasing. Constant rearrangement. Yeah. But still, he explains impermanence very well. And uh, that was the com part of the conversation I wanted to share about um, quantum physics and uh, the scientific part. And the other part I was sharing was with uh, somebody who contacted me, and uh, we began to talk about things. And I was talking about uh, um, how I became ordained into Buddhism. And so uh, I began to tell him that um, actually it was not in Thailand. Actually, the conversation began a lot further back than that in England. How at the age of 16 I became very involved in the occult society and the occult circles. And he was surprised that, uh, my friend was surprised that in the West we had such an occult tradition, which we do and in the city I came from was actually the occult centre of, of Great Britain. And I had the honour to meet uh, people like uh, Patricia Crowther, who was uh, the last mouth-to-ear lineage transmission witch of the Gardnerian lineage, which is supposed to be the only actual lineage of Wiccans, which was not destroyed or broken from mouth-to-ear transmission uh, when the Christians tried to destroy paganism in in Albion or Great Britain, if you like, or UK or whatever you want to call it today, before the Romans and the Normans and the Angles and the Saxons came at the time of the Druids and stuff. There was a different religion in, in, in Albion and there was a different Wicca who built Stonehenge, not the Druids, the Druids came after, and so um, I was telling him how I got involved in that, and uh, hermetic magic, and um, 
works through a lot of things. The complete works of the Golden Dawn, Israel Rigardi, Dion Fortune, uh, Pat Crowther. Um, got to, made friends with some people in these circles, twice my age at the time. Rachel Wynn, the author of The Theatre of Magic. Chris Bray just lived around the corner. His shop was just around the corner, who was at the time, I believe, the head of the OTO in Great Britain and supplier of magical items to covens and various magical uh, societies around the world, who I often used to visit almost every other day and spent hours with chatting with and was very involved with uh, hermetic ritual magic and um, also you know Hua Jai Nak Brahat Sujipuli the the heart mantra of the pundit of the bandit of the knower of the philosopher is to sutta su, sutta listen ji uh, jintana think uh, Pucha, pucha, um, ask or inquiry, and uh, likit, li, likit, uh, write down. I always did that, and uh, I obtained many grimoires, the lesser and greater keys of Solomon, the king, and uh, the complete works of the Golden Dawn, everything I could get from Israel Rigardi, from uh, Gareth Knight, and... Uh, most of the, of course, all of the works of Alistair Crowley, which I don't want to talk about in this podcast. If I ever talk about that, then it will be a different podcast. Um, except that I don't recommend you getting into that, except for uh, academic purposes. Um, and we got past that, and... Uh, my friend asked, or this uh, person asked, who contacted me if I was a monk, uh, how I came to Buddhism. So I explained that actually I didn't come to Buddhism in Thailand, I came to Buddhism in Nepal. And I was initiated by uh, Lama Tenga Rinpoche of the Karmakaju lineage in Benchen Monastery. And uh, he knew it. He said, I just said Lama Tenga, and he said, Oh, Tenga Rinpoche, you are Kamakaju of Benchen Monastery. And my name is Dhammalundrup Namjal, uh, was my Dhamma name. But I replied that uh, I don't actually belong to any particular lineage anymore. But if I had to say so, I'd say it's closest to the Theravada forest monk tradition, the Tudong tradition. And what I call the true Lursi practice, Rusi practice, which is another podcast and another conversation. Which one Rusi, who I know and like to recommend, who's a, also a Westerner, but well, he's a he's a South Hemisphere, or actually he's from Oz. He's called Matt, uh, John Matt, um, Sakyant to Sakyant to, but uh, talking about Lursi is another matter because there's a lot of falsehood in that and I don't want to talk about it in this podcast so I didn't talk about my time as a Lucy I talked about my time as a monk and he asked me how many years I was a monk which I didn't answer because uh, I don't like that question because what really matters you know some people might ordain for half a year and really practice hard and attain something or some people might even not ordain and go listen to the Dhamma for a week and walk out of there and have become a stream enterer before any of the monks who are in the temple they heard the Dhamma in. And so that's irrelevant how long you have been a monk. Uh, what is important is how hard have you practiced and what, did, what insights have you gained? Have you seen, discovered what I had an idea? like artificial intelligence the Go, Alpha Go of Google had beat an 18 times world champion at the game of Go five out of four, uh, uh, 4 out of 5 times and it came up with genius ideas light bulb moments and they're saying how can it be inspired like a human 
lives. Actually, it isn't. Because when we have that light bulb moment, we think, I've had an idea. Actually, you haven't. It's just one possibility in a lot of mathematical possibilities that were there before you saw it. You didn't have an idea. You just discovered a possibility that already existed. Right? But because of our egos, we think, I had an idea. How can a machine like that have intelligence have an idea? It didn't have an idea. It did just the thing, same thing as you did. It searched and it discovered. And so it seemed like a gene. it was winning with genius ideas. But actually, it wasn't emulating the human and the hu because the human doesn't have an idea. He just thinks he does. Actually, he's just discovering things in the realms of possibility that already existed. Yeah, there's a lot of pathways and we don't see them all. And when we see something new, we think we've had an idea. Actually, somebody somewhere else on the planet has had it before us or is perhaps simultaneously having it. So whose idea is it? It's not anybody's idea. It's something that was just there to be discovered. Got it? So, uh, anyway talking about uh, being closest to the Theravada forest monk tradition, they said that, however, I don't believe in religious institutions, which I don't. Talking about the churches, the official churches, which I always call the Pharisees. In the olden days, you used to have to go and pay your dues to the Pharisee, who was the middleman, hmm, to speak to your God. And I say that we are all stardust and we are all made of the same thing as the universe. We are of the spirit and that we do not need a Pharisee to speak to our gods. You do not need, you are not separate from the universe if you learn to see that. You're made out of stardust and it's actually on a sub-molecular level there's nothing separating anything. There's just a big cloud of particles called the universe. There's nothing between my feet and the floor, only my imagination and certain rules of physics that stop me falling through and blending with it, right? But actually, on a molecular, sub-molecular scale, there's nothing separating my foot to, from the floor. And you don't need your Pharisee to speak to your God. And you definitely don't need to put money in the donation box just so that he can speak to you. Speak, speak to God for you, or your God for you. Uh, you're made of stardust, just like the whole universe, and you have the same power to communicate with, some people might say prime creator, some people might say God, some people might just say the universe, some people might say the spirit, the Holy Spirit, or the Buddha, or whatever you want, Allah. Whoever you want, however you want to see that, that's conditioned in my opinion. All thoughts are conditioned. All things, all material things and immaterial things like thoughts are conditioned. But you have the power to communicate with this prime creator or this universe with which you are connected and made from. Just as all other things in this universe, because everything is connected it's only that people have not awoken yet to the power that they possess and they don't realize it is within them. And my, I suppose my friend, I don't know, yes I do know his name now, uh, and he said how powerful the mind is and that the nature of our minds is the same, which is true. I said even though our thoughts are different, which is true. I took then advantage of that to go on to another of my favorite topics, which doesn't contradict him. I just kind of slide it off into a different direction, the conversation here. So the nature of our minds are the same, even though our thoughts are different. Well said, my friend. Well said. Uh, but I then changed direction and said, well, thoughts, they are conditioned mental constructs of the brain. Right, which is called in Buddhism Sankara. Sankara means conditioned things. One of the five khandhas aggregates. Khandhas are aggregates. The five khandhas means the five aggregates. 
which all humans possess. All humans possess these five aggregates. Sankara is one of them. Which means in this case, because I'll talk about it in Sankara again afterwards, in this case means conditioned thoughts. The thoughts are conditioned by memory association. You smell strawberry, you feel happy, you like it because you remember having enjoyed strawberries. We have a body, we have the sense organs. This is called rupa, form. That's the first kanda, the first aggregate. Yeah. We have emotions and feelings and sensations. That is the vitana kanda, hmm? the kanda of feelings. The second aggregate, kanda, is aggregate feelings. Then we have perception slash memories. Perceptions and memories, which is sanya. Think of it like the transmission to your TV from the from the um, satellite. Or think of it like the transmission of the pain of burning your finger. How it travels through the nerve endings up to your brain and then you become conscious of it. That's perception. When you become conscious of it, you then think something. When you become conscious of it, memory happens first. You become conscious of the smell of strawberries. You remember strawberries. And whether you had a good or bad experience, your memory of that is going to condition your thought reaction. And then your thoughts will begin. Hmm. And that's perception also transmitting from the consciousness to the brain. And the brain starts thinking. Thoughts and consciousness are not the same thing. And uh, those thoughts then trigger emotions. Funnily enough, if you have a look inside, think of your enemy. Well, I'll get round to that. You have a look inside. Yeah. Because I'm not finished yet with the aggregates. So, Sankara, conditioned thoughts. Then we have. The last aggregate is vijnana, is consciousness, mm. thoughts and consciousness. If you think about it, thoughts come before emotions, and they trigger the emotions. Think of your emotions. Think. Let's think of emotions as your house. You're sitting in your house, listening to me in my house. Yeah. And... So emotions is your house, you in your house. And thoughts is me in my house. Mm. Thoughts and emotions. Two separate things in separate places. Doing different things. Then how does a thought trigger the emotion? Mm. How are you listening to me in your room? To me in my room? From you in your room? Because there is a transmission of data. And this transmission of data, which is actually happening on a physical level, through my iPad, and whatever instrument you're using, device you're using to listen to me to, through, mm, is a transmission of data. And your perception, once that enters your ears, in this case, and your eyes, if you're looking at whatever thumbnail I've placed on this podcast, um or whatever you're looking at, if your eyes are open, is going to be conditioning your thoughts. It is doing so right now. Reactions. And your likes and dislikes. And so on. And so, uh, perception. That's what's transmitting between, that's what's passing the ping pong ball. That's what's passing the baton from your brain to your feelings. So your thoughts then condition your memory association conditions your thoughts. Your thoughts then condition your feelings. Mm. So you remember something good, uh, bad, an enemy, you get angry. And then the anger sends the perception back. Your mind becomes aware of the anger. Your uh, consciousness becomes aware. You start then to proliferate the thought and you amplify it. And then you send it back to your heart and your emotions get even stronger. And it's like a ping pong game, like a ping pong ball. 
And Sanya, this perception is one of the five aggregates I have listed. Go back and listen again if you can't remember. Or write five aggregates on Wikipedia and study. Sujibuli, huh? Fang, uh, listen. Uh, 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 listen, think, ask, write, and study. Do your studies. What are the five aggregates? And so how does, of these five aggregates, the one, which is perception, is the transmitter between the other four aggregates? And we say Sankara conditioned things is conditioned thought, which is only one aggregate. But actually the other four aggregates are also conditioned because consciousness triggers memory. Memory conditions thought. Thought conditions emotion. Emotions condition the thoughts again until there is a physical reaction or you speak or you dance or you hit somebody or whatever. And then that's another talk. Is there karma involved there? That's a different talk, another day. So sanya, this perception and mem memory association in conjunction with your consciousness. And how sanya then transmits it through your body, to your feelings, to your heart. To the heart is not a physical. Mm? Rupa is the first kanda, is the physical parts of your body. Vitana is just nama, is not rupa. We have name and form, only two things, name and form. Physical things are form and they have a name. But some things aren't physical, but they do have a name. Mm. Feelings are not physical, but they are real, they exist, they happen. You become aware of them. The wind blows outside, you become aware of it. Feelings happen, you become aware of them. They are not self. Just like the wind. So when perception of an object, a sound, a smell, a taste, or a physical sensation enters the awareness, then memory association happens, and thoughts begin to make conditioned conclusions. Or even awareness of a thought can send then the transmission of perception to the heart and trigger the emotion. You try thinking again of something that makes you angry. Then try thinking of something that makes you really sad. And then try to think of something that makes you laugh. Try that. When you've done that, you will see. You will see for yourself that thoughts trigger emotions. If you look deeper, you will see how the emotions bounce back to the thoughts and the thoughts pro proliferate and then further trigger the emotions if you get lost in it. If you are mindful, then you can escape this process. Mindfulness is the practice, which is not part of this podcast, but we'll mention it there. This is why mindfulness is important, because it's how you escape the process. So seeing how thoughts trigger emotions helps you to see dependent origination as well helps you to see uh, a chain of events which in which we are locked, which keep us in an illusory uh, view of reality that is unenlightened and causes our behavior to be completely uh, aberration. It's an aberration from nature. Mm. And so the thing is, a perception is a thing that transmits a message from the thoughts to the feelings. Think of it like a ping pong ball. As soon as you think of your enemy, anger begins to rise up in the heart. It bounces back to the mind, and the mind amplifies the thoughts and increases the negativity. And then it bounces back like a ping pong ball to the heart, and then it gets even angrier. So the third aggregate, which is perception, sanya, is the culprit, so to speak, that transmits all of the messages between all of the other four aggregates. And this is what causes the human condition. And condition is the proper word because we are conditioned. Hmm? Sankara is thought processes, or pathological thought, if you like. It's not the only conditioned thing. 
all of the other four aggregates are also conditioned, as is the complete material universe, which is why in Buddhist the, uh, the theology, the the academics, they say there are two forms of sankara, of conditioned things, sankara of conditioned thought within the five aggregates, the five khandhas of the human body, living human being, and sankara meaning everything in the material universe. Because it's impermanent, it's always changing, so it's dukkha, it's dissatisfactory, and it's not self, it's anatta, it cannot be controlled by yourself. Yeah, it does what it wants, you cannot make the world stop spinning. You can try as hard as you want, things do what they want, things will happen as they happen, and you can't change it. You do Try as hard as you want. Shit happens, it's going to happen. Believe me, it doesn't matter what you do. You cannot foresee what's going to happen. Oh, don't believe me. Figure it out for yourself. The Buddha always said, don't believe me. I agree with him. So the second type of Sankara conditioned things is the physical universe. Maybe you've already found and concluded with me that emotions are conditioned by thoughts. And that our thoughts are conditioned by memory association and perception. Our body is conditioned by lots of things, including our thoughts, our feelings, and even how we treat ourselves as we grow older, and our health. Uh, we smoke cigarettes, we get cancer, you know, this is all conditioned. They say it's karma, I say it's conditioning. They say it's cause and effect. It's a law of dharma, it's a law of physics. They're the same laws, they're no different. The law is the law. You can call it physics if you want, science, or you can call it dharma, call it what you want. It agrees with each other. And the more we find out scientifically, the more it agrees with each other. <laughs> believe me. Our senses are conditioned. Yeah, don't believe me. Just check it out for yourself. Our senses are conditioned because even your retina cannot perceive all the wavelengths of light. Excuse me. You can't be easily tricked. Uh, you can be easily tricked. A trick of the light. That's why we have the phrase, it was a trick of the light. Right? So our sense organs can't be trusted. Sounds platonic. Or was it Socrates? Who was it who said you couldn't trust the senses? Was it Plato, Socrates? or Anyway, that's why we humans live in a world that is illusory. Because our sense organs limit and we're caught within a pathological thinking process and that uh, unenlightened humans, unenlightened beings, sorry, because there's more than just humans, there are devas, there are other planets and so uh, sentient beings uh, mostly don't understand the process of dependent origination and uh, it's a very complicated academic topic, so you Google that and study it, dependent origination, Padicca Samupad, Padicca Samupada, the dependent origination, 12 stages, because they can be seen within your five aggregates. If you study, when you examine within the process of how you are perceiving, becoming conscious, how your emotions are arising, what comes first, what comes after, mm? in the sequence of events, in between your thoughts and your reactions and your feelings, uh, and your body and your senses, and examine and investigate. Uh. Are you listening? Yeah. Are you inquiring? Are you thinking? Are you inquiring? Are you writing? Writing means you could uh, jot it down in your memory. That's writing it down. Because in the days they made the katha, sujibuli, they didn't have writing. So when they said li for likit, meaning writing, they must have meant jot it down in your brain. So um, if you're listening and you're thinking and you're questioning and you're writing, then you're performing the four qualities of the of the pundit, of the of the genius or of the philosopher. You are seeking the stone of the philosopher, wisdom, understanding. You need to know the five aggregates. You need to know what the um, Four Noble Truths mean in their full depth. 
and you need to study the five aggregates, understand what they are, and examine yourself, examine your own five aggregates within, and especially sanya, perception and memory, the role it plays with the other four khandhas. And when you've done that, then you can look at dependent origination afterwards, after you have spent some time examining the five khandhas and tilakana, the three marks of existence, and ask yourself within each khanda that you examine, each of the five aggregates, your body, your feelings, your perceptions and memories, your conditioned thoughts and your consciousness, if it is impermanent, if it's constantly in transient change, like the sand dunes, or if it's still and unchanging, and if it is dissatisfactory because it is impermanent and cannot be maintained in the same state, you would like it to be maintained. I'd like to stay happy. I don't want to become sad by tomorrow morning, but I can't control it. I don't know. Sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm sad. You know, sometimes I feel ill, sometimes I feel healthy. I can't control it, right? It's not self. It's beyond the control of the self. It is therefore not self. It's like the wind. It comes and goes as it will. We have no control. And so we need to look at these three marks of existence if they are present within our five aggregates, within our body, our consciousness, our feelings, our body, our senses, our conditioned thoughts and our perception and memory and see them all, learn to see them within. Learn to see the three marks of existence ruling all of those things within. And the trick is to look at these five aggregates inside yourself and watch the ping pong ball of, of perception and memory. Watch it go round and round and see if the three marks of existence are present within each of the five aggregates. I told my friend, it's an eye-opening experience, and it's the heart of the Kamatan Vipassana, Forest Buddhist monk practice. But yes, I did ordain originally into the Karmakaju, Karmapa lineage of the Tibetan Vajrayana, Yellow Hat, uh, Mahayana and Vajrayana tradition and took teachings from Ringu Tulku Rinpoche and Taisi Tupa Rinpoche, who are both Tulkus of the Karmapalama. But uh, I don't believe in institutions. I've received teachings. I've been a monk. I didn't tell him how long I was a monk for, because it's irrelevant. I didn't even tell him that for years before I was a monk, I spent most of my time in white, in temples, because I didn't have money, and I was eating free food and learning the Dhamma, and learning how to practice, and learning the, the Vinaya pit, uh, Pitaka, the rules of Buddhist monks, and learning everything I could, how to read and write Thai, speak Thai, Kaum, Makara, sacred script, Sakyant, the magical side, until I found the real side and the forest Buddhism and then I found the teachings of the Buddha which are essential for yourself to do what AI does and create a self-learning process that is correct because you follow the basic principles which the Buddha gave and you stick to those principles and the algorithm uh, with which you develop in Dhamma and uh, tread the path towards enlightenment and towards stream entry. Uh, so long as you stay within these parameters which the Buddha gave, you will arrive there and you will um, attain the cessation of suffering. And... Uh, we have to look at ourselves, look at your senses, learn about the khandhas, learn the three marks of existence. The Four Noble Truths it sounds like the simplest when you read it, actually it's one of the deepest. But you look at the five khandhas, examine them within yourself, learn what the three marks of existence are, and ponder them as you gaze within and examine the events which occur within your five 
aggregates, your five candas, you know, and you will see one day the process of dependent origination happening, the thing that makes us always keeping reborn in illusory existence. And if you see that, you see the three marks of existence, you see um, dependent origination within your khandhas. When you see that, you will attain stream entry. And when you attain stream entry, of the many kinds of beings you can be born as, it is said that you will be never born as a hell being or a hungry ghost or an asura monster or as an animal. And you will only either be born as a human or a deva in a pleasant abode, healthy, with all needs provided and within not more than seven lifetimes you will attain the fulfillment of the path or what they say, the eightfold path, arahanship, nibbana uh, the cessation of the causes of rebirth you will escape the chain of dependent origination which you will learn to see through examining your five khandhas and considering using the three marks of existence as a measuring stick to check your five candas and especially paying attention to the process of perception and memory association and consciousness and emotions and the sequence, what comes first, what comes after, does it bounce back and does it amplify what I've already spoken. And so you search for Skanda or five aggregates on Wikipedia and three marks of existence. Yeah. And uh, you do that first. And then when you meditate, just breathe as naturally as you want. If you know how to watch your breath and meditate, do so. If not, just close your eyes and start thinking about your candas and analyze academically, just think about them and then try to look at them. Try to think, what's an emotion? Where do I feel it? Is it in my chest? Is it physical or is it nowhere? Does it spread out? Do I feel hot physically when I'm angry? Start investigating. And uh, it will go deeper naturally. The more interested you get and the more you discover yourself and get to know yourself, in the land of not-self, uh, then uh, I think it becomes fun. And you will start to understand the practice of vipassana, of to develop insight into the true nature of reality, which is, for me, the meaning of the word patam, or uh, tamma, the dharma, means the uh, true nature of existence, of reality true reality, to awaken to true reality. So that was the end of this podcast, which I have now decided I will add to one of my podcast categories on YouTube, namely the Ashram Talks playlist. And I can't even remember how I began this podcast with what title. So it's going in the Ashram Talks. And that's the end of a very long talk which is spontaneous and I hope you enjoyed and I hope is useful in your practice and is of interest. Ajahn Spencer signing off.